Questions 1 to 4. You will hear a talk about a museum. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Welcome to the Museums UK audio series, a collection of downloadable audio files introducing the best of British museums. My name's Sam Cooper and in this file I'll be introducing the Ashmolean Museum of Art and Archaeology in Oxford with its fabulous collections of Eastern and Western art, antiquities, casts and coins. It's one of the oldest public museums in the world and it's actually part of Oxford University, though it's free to go in whether you're a student or not. You'll find the main museum in Beaumont Street, near the centre of Oxford, close to both the railway station and the bus station. Opening hours for visitors are from 10 o'clock in the morning till 5 in the evening on Tuesdays to Saturdays, 12 to 5 on Sundays and 10 to 7 on Thursdays in the summer months. It usually closes for three days over Christmas, a couple of days at New Year and three days for the St Giles Fair in early September. You can take photos in the galleries, but only with handheld cameras and not using flash or lights, which can do serious harm to exhibits. Also, as long as you follow all the copyright regulations and you get permission from the staff on duty, you can ask for antiquities documents of less than 100 years in age to be photocopied at a cost of 5p per A4 sheet. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Perhaps not surprisingly, given its links with the university, the Ashmolean has an education service for schools and the general public. Activities include guided group visits, which for adults last 60 minutes and cost £4 each. This makes the minimum price per group £28, as group sizes vary from 7 to 15 people. Visits by groups of young people take the same amount of time as the adult tours, but cost just £2 for university students. So, with at least seven to a group, the lowest price is £14, though please note that there's an upper limit of 14 group members rather than the 15 for adults. For schools, there are visits to suit all age groups, and for the most popular ones, such as those to see the Greek and Egyptian collections, it's best to book a term in advance. Tours last 50 minutes, starting at 10.15, 11.30 and a quarter past one, with a maximum of 13 children per group. Now, if you're free in the middle of the day, why not go along to one of the 45-minute lunchtime talks? There's a really wide range of topics. On the 19th, for example, the subject is Greek mythology, and on the 20th, there's Celebration of India. Both begin at 1.15, the usual time for these talks, and they're held every Tuesday, Wednesday and Friday. Another regular feature, on Saturday mornings through to the afternoons, are the workshops. If you're interested in developing your own illustrative and artistic skills, these are for you. They're aimed at artists of varying levels of experience and are always led by practising artists. Running for six hours from 10 o'clock... This is wonderful value at just £5, including basic materials and also a decent cup of coffee. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a dialogue between a foreign student and a student union officer. As you listen, answer the following questions. First, look at questions 11 to 13. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 13. Good morning, can I help you? Yes, I'd like to know something about the British medical scheme. Yes, what's your question? Can I use British doctors if I fall ill? That will depend on how long your course of study is. If it is six months or more, then you are entitled to treatment from the British Medical Scheme, called the National Health Service, NHS, as if you were a British citizen. With the NHS, consultations with doctors are free, but you will be asked to pay something towards the cost of medicines. In 1987, this is £2.40 for each item of medicine. You are also entitled to free treatment in British hospitals. Always make sure the doctor knows you want treatment from the NHS, as doctors also take private patients, who pay the full cost of all their treatment. How do I make sure I can be treated by the NHS? If you are eligible for treatment, that is, you are registered on a course of six months or longer, then the first thing you should do is to register with a doctor. You should register with any doctor close to where you live. Local post offices have lists. Now look at questions 14 to 20. All you need to do is visit the doctor or the doctor's receptionist during consulting hours and ask to be included on the doctor's list of patients. If the doctor decides to accept you, you will then be sent a medical card by post which will carry your National Health Service number. Take great care not to lose this. If the doctor cannot accept you, try elsewhere or contact the local family practitioner committee. You can get the address from the post office or any doctor. Find out your doctor's consulting hours from the doctor or the receptionist and ask whether or not you need to make an appointment before seeing the doctor. Remember to be on time for any appointment you make. You can see him or her during those hours unless you are seriously ill. If you are seriously ill, the doctor can be called out to see you. Once you have registered, you should tell your warden, landlord, landlady or a friend the name, address and telephone number of your doctor so that if you are suddenly taken ill, the doctor can be called out to see you. I see. Could you tell me something about British hospitals? Yes. Hospitals provide specialist treatments or treatment for which any kind of extended stay is required. Your doctor will recommend you to go if it is necessary. Casualty or emergency treatment following accidents is free for everyone. As not all hospitals provide such services, you should find out which local hospitals do in case you ever need treatment. How about dental care in Britain? You can find lists of dentists who give National Health Service treatment at local main post offices. You do not register with a dentist but you should ask whether they are willing to give you NHS treatment. 
as dentists are free to accept or refuse patients and to provide private treatment only. If you are accepted, you should give the dentist the NHS number which is on your medical card. There is a charge for all dental treatment. For basic treatment, this could be up to £17. More extensive dental treatment will cost more if you are not registered with a doctor. You will have to pay the full cost of dental treatment as a private patient. You will have to make an appointment to see your dentist and should give notice if you are unable to attend an appointment or you will be charged for loss of time. You should try to have your teeth checked at least once per year by the dentist. From the NHS, you are entitled to a free six monthly checkup. Thank you very much. This helps me a lot. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between Sally and Ben. They are new college students. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Now, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Ben. Sally. How are you? Fine. I wondered if I'd run into you. When did you get here? I only arrived last night, just in time. I prefer to travel on Sundays to miss the working rush. I suppose you arrived in plenty of time. Oh, I've been here for four days now. So it must have been Thursday that I arrived. I like to have a good chance to look around and settle in. I should have come earlier too. I'm hoping to get a part-time job. Well, you've no time today, I suppose. Do you still plan to be an architect? Yes. It's what I've always wanted to do. And you were planning to do economics, weren't you? Yes, I was. But now I've decided on psychology instead. How many textbooks do you have to get? I've been given this long list, and I'm sure they'll cost a fortune. See? That looks a lot. It's longer than my list. Well, it's 14, all told. So I might use library copies instead of buying some of them. What about you? I'll probably buy the whole lot of mine because I only have five on my list. Although I'm sure there are many more I'll have to read. Luckily, we don't have to read them all straight away. Have you got your class timetable yet? It came with the book list. When do your lectures start? Tuesday. That's tomorrow. How about yours? Oh, I've got an extra day. The day after yours start. Now you have some time to read questions 26 to 30. As the conversation continues, they are talking about their new college life. Listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. It's nothing like school, is it? Not so far, and the lectures will certainly be different. Do you have any special approach for keeping up with lectures and the amount we have to read? Well, I usually try to read every word in a book in case I miss something important, so I suppose I'll try to write down every word of the lecture if I can. Oh, I couldn't do that. 
I'd get cramp in my fingers and I wouldn't really hear what was being said. I usually skim a book when I read and underline key parts, so I guess I'll try to make notes on the main points of the lecture. Have you thought of using a cassette recorder? You mean to record the lecture? Yep. Then you could make really good notes. Is it allowed? I think so. It must be. Plenty of people seem to do it. It has to be better than trying to write every word as you listen. Anyway, what's your first lecture about? Oh, it's on the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution? Sounds boring to me. Not really. It made a big difference to everything, including architecture eventually. So what's your first lecture about? It's about what separates humans from other animals. OK. Look, I was on my way to the library to check out some of these books on my list. I have a tutorial paper to give in a couple of weeks. Oh, what's the topic? Well, I think our lecturer must have trouble thinking up topics. The topic is, why study architecture? I don't know. It could give you a chance to set out what you want to do. I guess so. Have you been given any tutorials to do yet? Yes. Mine is called Needs for Sleep. Sounds almost as interesting as mine. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about some British customs. Listen to the talk and complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. My name is Marsha Smith, a counsellor here at the Student Services section of the University. And this morning, I'd like to talk to you about visiting a British home. This may help you to cope well with your study and social life in Britain. There is a commonly quoted saying in Britain, an Englishman's home is his castle, which sums up the importance we give to our own bit of private territory. If you are living in a British home, or are invited to visit or stay with someone, it is important to act thoughtfully. For example, be punctual for meals and, if you know you have to miss one, let your host know as soon as possible. Check whether it is convenient for others in the house when you wish to take a bath or wash and dry laundry. And unless your host employs someone to do the housework, you are expected to make your own bed and keep your room clean and tidy yourself. If you don't have a door key, remember to make arrangements if you intend to be out late. And keep your hosts informed of your whereabouts so they don't worry. These suggestions apply whether you are a guest or a lodger and will help the household to run smoothly. If you're staying as a guest of a British family, or even visiting for one meal, it is customary to take a small gift of flowers, chocolates, or something to drink. Don't spend too much, as this could embarrass your hosts. If you're staying for several days as a guest, it is usual to give a small present when you leave. Usually, you will get onto first-name terms with people you meet quite naturally and quickly. If you're unsure, continue to use their family name, surname, and title, until they ask you to use their first name. Older people, and those with whom you have a more formal relationship, 
may prefer to stick to surnames. For example, Doctor Smith or Mrs. Smith. If you're going to eat with British people or to stay with a British family, you may want to know if there are things that they normally do or don't do at the table. Rather than worry too much about rules, you may like to watch other people and copy what they do. It also helps to understand a few customs first. Both at home and in restaurants, people normally wait until everyone has got their food before they start eating. However, they will start before this if someone says. Please don't wait, or don't let it get cold. When people have started, they keep their cutlery—knives, forks, and spoons—on the plate when they are not using them, and leave them on the plate when they finish the course. For each course, different cutlery is used. You may also notice that people don't usually spend much time at the table talking, drinking, and smoking. In fact, after dinner at home. It's fairly common for everyone to leave the table together and have coffee in the living room. If you are staying with a family or visiting informally, it's usual to offer to help with household chores, for example, clearing the table and washing up the dishes after a meal. Even men are expected to offer, though you may not be accepted. At a more formal meal, however, the host won't normally expect guests to help. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Left side, the right brain drives me insane. Don't lie. So, without wasting any time, let's start the video. So, the first and the foremost tip is concentration, because it is the key point to crack the maps in listening. I know in each and every tip, I always say the very first point is concentration, because it is actually very important. As if we will not concentrate properly, we will not lose. Any answer because in map, what is there? A kind of map will be given to you with the labeling A, B, C, D, E, and F somewhere in the listening module. What you have to do is you have to be concentrated. That where is from where we have to start. Okay, so definitely the answer will be in a sequence. That means from A to B, then he will, then the answer is C, then D, then E, and so on. Suppose if we will not hear about A, we will not get the to the point of what he said in the A. We will stuck there, right? We will not get the answer of A. That means it will lose our concentration. It will affect our Concentration, and we will not able to move to the point B because we will not come to know when A appear. So how we will come to know about the B in the listening module? Okay, so be concentrated over there. Now, next word is know about the direction. So most probably in maps they use direction. Okay, they they say that in the north direction. It was built. It. It was a library. Moving further to the stairs, you go upstairs in the east direction. So you must be aware of the direction. That where is north, east, south, and west. Suppose these are the direction. So this is north, south, east, and west. Okay. So these directions are north east direction, and this will be between. In between, it is. Southeast. So you must be aware of all these directions. Then only you can 
tackle the situation of direction in the maps most of the student lose their marks because they are not aware of these directions okay so be aware of these directions so that you will not lose your marks next word is practice do practice a lot okay if it is your weaker section in listening so i would say do practice of this section in which more maps were given to you okay you you don't have to do all the listening if you think you are good in listening but you are lacking in map so what you can do you can just check out that it, is this listening is having maps so do concentrate on that part of your uh, that means weaker part of your listening module okay so now moving further the last tip for today is don't panic yes of course do not panic as all the answers are linked to one and another right you will be getting the answers one after the another so if you will panic at one answer you will not be able to hear the further right we if we were given any kind of map right here are stairs this is a you have to answer this this is b okay if you have an, uh, entered from this direction so you must be aware of that this is your left and this is your right okay so be aware of the left and right directions as well okay now if you will panic over here your concentration as i said do concentrate your concentration lacks right you lack in your concentration and you will not be able to answer the further point so i would suggest that as in maps one after another you will get answer all the answers are interlinked with each other so do not panic and be calm and composed okay if you haven't heard about answer a don't worry leave it move further okay because if in a map there are suppose a b c d and e five points are there and you haven't listened to a and if you will stuck here you will lose mark for this 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 and this instead of losing four more marks that means b c d e it's better to leave one mark okay if you haven't heard about a move to b c d and e it will give you four marks okay instead of five but if you will stuck here you will lose all the five marks so this was for today i'll meet you in the next video if you like the video do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel Till then bye bye and take care